It's great to be back in Beverly. Love this town. USS Indianapolis. This is, this is a hard story to tell. It, uh, it has the best and it has the worst in humanity. It's uh, a, a series of things that went wrong, but you know, it's great history and it, it's, it warrants being told periodically so that we don't forget the sacrifices that these men put forth. She was launched November the 7th, 1931 from the New York Shipbuilding Corporation in Camden, commissioned in 1932 at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. $11 million. Navy gets a ship 610 feet long with a 66 foot beam, displacement of 11,180 tons. She has a primary armament of nine eight inch guns uh, mounted in three turrets. And the, the range of these guns, uh, eight inch guns, was about uh, 18 miles. She also has a secondary armament of five inch guns the ship would carry five scout planes and they would be launched from catapults. These planes, this, this was uh, definitely before radar had come to uh, fruition. And uh, the planes would fly ahead, they would guide the accuracy of the gunners, they would look for the enemy, they would uh, do rescue work. She had eight boilers. These boilers could propel her four shafts at a maximum speed of 32 knots. Uh, I love the clipper type bow on the front of her. She was a very, very fast ship. When she was commissioned, 1932, when the Navy formally took over, her crew was 906 men and 46 officers. She was also designed to serve, she had extra capacity to carry uh, admirals. She, she could be a flagship of a fleet and uh, she had better accommodations than her sister ship, the Portland. Uh, with these accommodations, it kind of qualified her to serve as President Roosevelt's favorite ship. Here's a picture of him. <clears throat> he would take her on uh, cruises to the uh, on you know, showing the flag on goodwill tours to South America and uh, several other voyages. Her peacetime years, spent mostly in the Atlantic and the Pacific, showing the flag, showing America's naval might. But from the beginning of the war, she would find herself in the, in the Pacific. And the Indianapolis would take place in just about every major campaign in the Pacific. She'd see combat in the Aleutians, the Gilberts, the Marshalls, the Marianas, Saipan, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. Now through all of these ships, she would serve, she would be a lucky ship. She had no casualties whatsoever. That changed in March 1945. On the 31st of March, a bomb from a Japanese plane would hit aft it would go down three decks before it exploded and it would cause severe damage. It would uh, kill nine men. It would damage the two starboard uh, shafts. Basically, this took her out of combat for uh, a, a period of months. She went back to the Mare Island shipyard in California. May 5th, she was there and she was probably going to be there through July. Uh, during, the, during this uh, refit, here's another picture of her peacetime. Here are the, the, main, the main guns. Here are the catapults and the cranes which would retrieve the planes. Well, launching these planes, they were shot right off the catapult and when it was time to retrieve them, they would simply fly along, uh, they'd, they'd float along the side of the ship and the ship would lower a big sling and they'd pick her up on the sling and remount her on the catapults. It wasn't high technology, but it worked. This is a picture of her taken during uh, one of her refits. Uh, <clears throat> here are the, the main armament. These areas, I don't know if you really can't see them uh, too well, but there's like a, this is highlighted. There are, 
circles highlighting here, and what they do is they reflect the changes to the ship during the refit. And she would, uh, the modifications, <clears throat> she'd get additional anti-aircraft guns, she'd get updates to her fire control systems, updates to communication systems. The one thing the Navy, American as well as British and other uh, navies learned, was that you need anti-aircraft protection. That's, is that, got to get rid of that hum. Okay, maybe if I stand this way. You need anti-aircraft protection because surface ships going against aircraft uh, was not a good situation. During the first six months of the war, the Japanese were able to really effectively neutralize a lot of American ships and British ships. So anti-aircraft guns were always, always being added to cruisers, destroyers, uh, any size, major size ship. Here's the Indianapolis. Uh, here are the life rafts. Life rafts were everywhere. They're on this turret. They're on this turret. They're over here. As the war went on, they realized that lifeboats, wooden boats, the captain's uh, launch, the, and wooden lifeboats, they were flammable. And they caught on fire easily. Sorry about this. I hate technology. <laughs> Thanks. So as the war goes on, you'll see fewer and fewer wooden, uh, wooden uh, lifeboats. And they're replaced by life rafts. The refits going along fine. McVeigh, there were even some men, there were even some people in the crew that thought, you know what, we might not have to go back into combat. The war might be over. This is July of 45. Well, that prevailing viewpoint would change on July 12th. July 12th, Captain McVeigh realizes his ship is to go on a top secret mission. His ship is to take a cargo that nobody is to know anything about. It is completely ultra, ultra top secret. It's to be guarded 24 hours a day. Nobody is to be authorized near it. And if the ship does sink, this cargo is to have top priority in the rescue. There would be two army officers accompanying this ship. As we all know, the cargo was the atomic bomb. The thing that McVeigh was told was, get this thing safely to Tinian Island. The sooner you get there, the sooner the war might end. This is Captain McVeigh, Charles V. McVeigh, Navy man. His father was an admiral. Uh, a very, very well-respected officer. Uh, drove the men hard, but generally regarded as a, as a very capable leader. Uh, respected, good qualifications, very, very good, good, good track record. July 16th, 8 o'clock in the morning, Indianapolis clears the Golden, Bra Golden Gate Bridge. She's headed for Pearl Harbor and then to Tinian Island. After three days at flank speed, Diamond Head was sighted. This set a record of 2,091 miles in 74 and a half hours. This record still stands. Now at Pearl Harbor, the men were uh, severely disappointed because they thought they might get a little short time. All hands confined to the ship. She spent six hours getting provisions and fuel, and then she would depart for Tinian. One more picture of her in combat. These are some of her officers. Also, <clears throat> on July 16th, the day the Indy leaves for Tinian, <clears throat> another ship would depart on a war cruise. The Japanese submarine I-58, she would leave from Curry, Japan, on patrol in the seas adjacent to the Allied shipping routes in the Philippines. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, 
Adam Spruance, Ernest King. Ernest King was the admiral, the fleet admiral. He was the top of the Navy food chain. He was the highest naval officer in the active Navy. Here is uh, Nimitz. <coughs> yeah. And this is some insignificant army general. <laughs> there she is under fire. This is just going ahead a little bit. This is the secret weapon. <clears throat> this map is not the best, but I want to show you a little bit of the geography. Here is Tinian. Here is Saipan. Guam is down here. And this, that's over in, in the Mariana Islands here. Over here are the Philippines. This is the Japanese uh, command structure. But I just want to show you. So you, basically, we're going to be talking from Guam to the Philippines. I-58. This is the I-58. She's a Japanese submarine. She's one of the few left in the Japanese, Japanese Navy. She's built in 1944, 355 feet long. She's a little bit longer than her American counterpart. She's about twice the size of a German U-boat. She has six torpedo tubes, all forward. She doesn't have any aft. And she, <coughs> she uh, carries these suicide torpedoes, suicide submarines, which are launched from the deck. They're called Katens, K-A-I-T-E-N. And the word Katen stems from the Chinese meaning revolving the heavens. And well, the Japanese kind of interpreted that to be changing the tide. And the hope was that the Katens would be as effective below water as the kamikaze planes were in the air. Uh, the I-58 has the Catons, but she also has a very, very significant advantage over her American counterpart, which is her torpedoes. If the Japanese did one thing right prior to World War II and, well, say in the mid-30s, late-30s, uh, in the first couple of years of the war, it was the torpedo they developed. Their torpedoes were flawless. They worked, well, they had a 24-inch diameter. Here's, here's a picture of one. It was called the Type 95 torpedo. The warhead, it was 890 pounds, and by the time the war was in the late 40s, it was uh, 1,210 pounds. She was driven by oxygen. She didn't leave a wake. They could go at a speed of 48 knots. They could go, uh, their range was five to seven miles with accuracy. The American torpedoes for the first couple of years uh, were dismal failures. Half the time they didn't explode, they had faulty uh, controls. The Japanese torpedo was a, a very, very dreaded weapon. And not to digress, but it was not only the torpedoes on the submarines, it was the torpedoes that they launched from surface ships that were ex equally, equally effective. This is Lieutenant Commander Machuro, Mach, Mach, Machusura Hashimoto. He's a career officer, trains the crew constantly, well respected by the men. 1944, 1945, Japan's glory days at war are over. Things are definitely uh, not going well for the Japanese. He is extremely frustrated. He's, he's been in the Navy, hasn't really had a chance to make an impact, hasn't really brought any glory to the emperor. Uh, the, war is, the war is going badly, although the Japanese won't admit it. As they departed Kirby, all the crew, and especially the Caton pilots, are really pumped. They are absolutely thrilled at last, a chance to bring the war to the Americans and glory for, for the emperor. Now, the mission 
was not to attack the major fleet, American fleet. It was simply to harass the communication lines. It was unrealistic to think that the submarines were going to make a significant difference. Now, <clears throat> timetable here. July 23rd, the Indianapolis is still en route to Tinian. She get, uh, there is a top secret ultra message, and it's sent to 11 different Pacific commands. Now, top secret ultra was the highest priority in a secret or a confidential message. This goes to 11 different Pacific commands. It tells about the sightings and the activities of Japanese submarines, including the, seek, the sinking of one submarine. It also tracks the I-58 somewhere in the vicinity of the Caroline and the Mariana Islands in the central Philippine Sea. Now the Philippine Sea covered a huge area and it was, cause it was so big it was divided into different commands, both the Japanese viewpoint and the American. And on one side was the commander Mariana's area with headquarters at Guam. And the commanding officer there was uh, Admiral George Murray. I mention these names now because they're going to pop up later on. The other command was in the Philippines, and they call that the Philippine Sea Frontier. And the commander there was a guy named uh, Norman Gillette. So you got these two different commands that are getting these messages along with nine other groups. July 23rd, the message goes out. July 24th. The destroyer USS Underhill was sunk by a Japanese submarine with a loss of 112 men. She's lost in the vicinity of the Allied shipping route to the Philippines. Four days later, July 28th, a merchant ship. This merchant ship, she's called the Wild Hunter. She's just on her way to the Philippines and she sights a periscope about 75 miles south of the route to the Philippines from Guam. She notifies the destroyer. The destroyer, Albert Harris, chases the sub for six hours. She loses contact. But she sends an urgent secret message to Guam and to the Philippine Sea Frontier saying, enemy sub pursued, launched hedgehogs, no effect. Meanwhile, on the 26th of July, the Indianapolis arrives at Tinian. She unloads the bomb. She receives orders stating, upon completion of unloading a Tinian, go to Guam, report to the port director for routing to Leyte for 10 days of additional training and assignment to Task Force 95.7. Because they're getting ready to invade the homeland sometime in November. So they're putting together task force. The, these orders telling her to go to Guam to get rooting and ultimately go to the Philippines, they were sent to a bunch of recipients. And there were two classes of recipients. The first class was action, meaning if you're, if you're in this category and you get this, you've got to take action. And some of the people in that category were the port director in the Philippines, the shipping officer in Guam, the people that would be moving ships and keeping track of ships back and forth. The second class of receipts was information, meaning, yeah, you could be interested, but you really don't need to take any action. Now, the second class of recipients went higher up the food chain and went to Commodores. It went to people higher up in both the Philippines and the Marianas commands. July 27th, Indianapolis is in Guam. Captain McVeigh reports to Commodore James Carter for his routing to the Philippines. McVeigh hasn't been in action. He hasn't been in the front for a long time. So during his uh, appointment with uh, Carter, he says, what's going on in the front? Uh, you know, fill me in. What's up? What's new? And the response from Carter was, things are very quiet. The Japs are on their last legs, and there's nothing to worry about. 
Carter doesn't mention the Underhill sinking. He doesn't mention the Wild Hunter reports. He tells McVeigh, no, you know, it's not a big deal. You're going to take Route PD, P-E-D-D-I-E. -E. Route PD goes from Guam to the Philippines. <coughs> it's about 1,150 miles, excuse me, It's almost a straight shot from Guam to the Philippines. Now you look around here, this is the highway. Here's the wild hunter situation. Here's a surface sub, spot, uh, sub spotted. Oh, here's another sub contact over here. There's a lot of stuff going around right here. This is all before she, the Indianapolis hits. So. McVeigh says, well, can I have an escort? And Carter says, no, not really, because says, there, there aren't any destroyers or destroyer escorts available. Because the Okinawa campaign, which is where the kamikaze threat really mushroomed, there were 96 American ships either sunk or taken out of action because of the kamikazes. So McVeigh's said, well, are you, are you sure? And he says, yeah, there aren't any. He's, but Carter says, you're, you're going to be OK. So Carter says, here's the deal. You're going to go. Your speed is going to be 15.7 knots. And that'll bring you to the Philippines at 8 o'clock in the morning on July the 31st. The 15.7 knots was arrived at by the policy the Navy had that if you're not in danger and if you're not in a, a combat zone, try to cruise no, no faster than 16 knots because that's going to conserve fuel. It will save fuel. So there was some justification for that in that, well, there was nothing going on. There were no submarine reports. And McVeigh said, all right, is there anything else? And Carter says, no, that's about it. So. Now, his orders state that at July 30th, he will cross from the Marianas control area to the Philippine Sea. And this is, it's called the chop line. When, the, when she crosses this line, Philippines pick her up, Guam drops her. The chop line. It's going from one command zone to another. At 9 o'clock in the morning, July 28th, she weighs anchor and she heads for Guam. At the same time, a message is sent from Guam to the Philippines stating her ETA and her arrival. <clears throat> Nine o'clock, July 28th, she leaves Guam, 15.7 knots. 12 o'clock, she's sighted by a, an LST, an American landing ship, headed east. This would be the last friendly vessel to sight the Indianapolis. 6 p.m., the seas are turning choppy and rough, visibility's fair. Officer of the deck was Lieutenant J.G. Charles McKissick. He reads the message, the wild hunter message, describing the submarine sighting and the submarine escape. And there was also a projection that that submarine 70, would be 75 miles south of the Indianapolis the next day on, that, on her route. In, in the office's wardroom, McKissick actually jokes and he says, well, yeah, there's supposedly a Japanese sub out there, words to this effect. And the reply was, oh, well, our destroyers will take care of that. And they were kind of chuckling. Now, Captain McVeigh did not hear this part. And uh, he would have been chagrined because you know, he was a disciplinarian in that you don't joke about things like that. But this was in the ward room and the captain wasn't there. Still July 29th, 8 o'clock, rough seas, long swells, low heavy clouds, occasional glimpses of a pale moon. McVeigh issues the order to cease zigzagging. Below decks on the Indi Indianapolis, temperature is above 95 degrees. Engine room temperature, 120 degrees. No air conditioning. These ships were steamers in the tropics. 
Because of such, a lot of hatchways and door, doorways would be left open just to capture any kind of breeze they could. <coughs> Topside, they estimate there were at least 300 men topside with blankets trying to sleep to avoid the heat below decks. It was, it was okay. Uh, you wouldn't allow that if there was combat situation, but it was, it was okay. The, the watertight condition was called condition yoke, which is, it is not, the ship is not buttoned down, watertight integrity. It's, it's a lot of doors are open, as I said, to allow air. There were at least 22 men topside on lookout duty. But the weather was, was uh, tough, poor visibility. 11 p.m., McVeigh retires to his cabin, leaves orders for the officers of the deck to wake him if there are any changes in the weather or sea conditions. On board the I-58, Lieutenant Commander Hashimoto raises periscope. He's looking for a target. He sees none. He surfaces for a better view. Suddenly a ship is spotted some six miles distant. He dives at once. He's not sure what she is. He knows she's American. He's puzzled that she's traveling alone. He plots her at uh, speed at 12 knots and she's at 1,500 meters. He orders six torpedoes ready. He sets the depth at 13 feet. At a little after midnight, 27 minutes after sighting the Indianapolis, the command of fire releases six torpedoes. It takes less than one minute for the first torpedo to hit the target. At 12.05, she hits forward on the starboard side just below the 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, and she blows 65 feet of the bow skyward. First torpedo hits right here. 65 feet of the, this bow is, is blown askance. There's now open water rushing in here. As soon as that torpedo hit, a huge fire broke, broke out in this area. 3,500 gallons of high octane aviation fuel are stored in this area. Anybody below decks in this area is immediately killed. These compartments would have been the sick bay, the forward enlisted berthing area, the marine berthing, the ship's steward quarters. One deck above, fires are raging through the officer's quarters. This wound was a result of the Type 95 torpedoes designed to inflict a mortal wound on a capital-sized ship. The first, it, it was two blasts in one, in one uh, torpedo. The first blast buckles the ship's skin blows a huge hole downward. The second blast blows a huge hole downward. And the purpose of the second blast was it displaces that water by the explosion, but once the water surges back up, it really damages the ship. It, in some cases, it could break the ship in half. Fires are raging all over, the, all over this area here. In engine room number one, all generators have failed, killing all lights and ventilation. Steam pressure goes from 300 pounds per square inch to 75 pounds per square inch. All personnel in boiler room number one are immediately killed. They're likely flash boiled because of the, the, uh, the, <coughs> the scalding steam. Top side, radio one uh, and radio two both radio rooms are damaged significantly. Fires are raging throughout the ship. Wounded men below decks are trapped by flooding or toxic smoke. At first, McVeigh thinks the ship can, she can stabilize, she'll be okay. A couple minutes later, he realizes no. Men are dispatched to radio two. They finally get off an SOS, but they're not sure how much of the message gets off because of the damage and it does not contain the ship's location. There's a bunch of things going wrong. McVeigh orders the men to abandon ship. Word races through to the men aft and elsewhere. Men are loosening floater rafts, life rafts, and the donning life jackets. 
All the while, the ship is listing to the, the has a list increasing to starboard. Engineering officer says, uh, I know, let's jettison the fuel to minimize the list. And that turns out to be a mistake because all of that fuel is going to rest on top of the water. In less than 12 minutes after being hit, the ship will sink, will roll over to starboard, and with her stern raised high, sink in some of the deepest water in the world. They estimate 300 men were lost during the explosion. If you were in this part of the ship here, there was relatively little damage. But going aft, it was increased significantly. I'm going to quote, usually I don't refer to literary uh, aspects, but this is a quote from uh, the book called In Harm's Way by Doug Stanton. And I think it, uh, I think it's very, very graphic description as the ship sank. There were no birds in the sky, no wind, only the lapping of the noxious stew of seawater and fuel oil against k Park life vests. There were no stars, just the occasional flash of a crescent moon, like a needle of bone threading its way through a flying curtain of clouds. At times, the exhausted boys floated in complete darkness, unable to discern any horizon at all, the sea rising and falling in heavy swells. At other moments, the boys were lit by a ghostly silver light. The living prayed out loud while the dying screamed. Depending on where you went overboard and when would decide which group, if any, you would be part of. As the ship was still slowly moving forward, men were abandoning over a period of about 10 minutes. Those in the water were in life rafts, floater nets, k life preservers, or in many cases with nothing at all. It was a blessing in disguise that due to a requisitioning error, there would be more than 2,500 life jackets on board, more than double the amount needed. Groups in the water would form, some as large as 400 men, mostly swimmers. 200 would be in rafts and float in nests, to as few as groups with two or three rafts and as small a group as nine men. Trying to stay together, they would tie rafts to each other. They would tie the ropes on the floater nets together, or simply lengths of loose ropes, just to try to keep everybody together to avoid drifting away. The currents were significant. By the time of rescue, some five days later, some groups, such as Captain McVeigh's group, would have drifted as much as 124 miles during the time in the water. The survivors would face numerous life-threatening challenges, all of which would become more and more lethal. Initially, there was a shred of hope that they must know we're missing. It won't be too long now. Sooner or later, these idiots are going to spot us. They'd see planes flying overhead. As the days wore on, hope of rescue diminished sharply. Hope was replaced by dehydration, exposure, hypothermia, dementia, a complete breakdown of rank and discipline, and a primal enemy, sharks. But there are also countless scenes of men trying to aid or encourage their buddies, even though there was little they could do. There were men trying to buoy their friends. There were men trying to help people with terrible wounds. Late Monday, the 30th, sharks began to appear. The sharks were oceanic white tips, a common ship type following, a common ship following type, and considered very dangerous. Initially, they would eat, just eat the dead bodies, floating or sinking to the depths. As time passed, <clears throat> they started to follow groups and attack men either swimming or clinging to the floater nets. Some men were able to fight them off. Some tried to remain perfectly still. It was estimated 
either one worked sometimes or didn't work. They estimate that, admit that at an absolute minimum, over 200 men fell victims to the shocks. That doesn't count the amount of men that simply got tired and gave up. Exposure was taking its toll. Daytime temperature was about 100 degrees. At night, it dropped to the mid-80s, causing the body temperature to drop significantly, leading to hypothermia, which brings on hypoxia, with the end result being amnesia and a general mental stupor. This loss of judgment led to de dementia, dementia and hallucinations. They've been in the water two days, three days, four days. They started seeing mirages and illusions such as, hey, there's a hotel just down below. <laughs> or they saw an island just, it wasn't that far. Or the water really isn't that bad for you. Just take some water from a couple feet under, it'll be okay. Or I'm getting in the car, I'm going home. They were, they were suffering. There, <clears throat> there were darker images which unleashed a horrible threat to the men. Men with knives began to attack other men claiming they were Japs so they were trying to kill me. Stark raving men would kill men they had been buddies with three days ago. They were pushing wounded men off the rafts or cutting the lifelines to the group. In these cases, total breakdown of rank and discipline. This, I think, is an amazing part of the story. To put a stop to this madness, several men banded together and agreed that they would kill any man perceived to be a threat to the others. They used a humane method of killing by putting the victim in a headlock and stabbing him below the armpit. A vow, <coughs> a vow was made among them and the witnesses never to divulge their names. Their memory of the deed would haunt them enough for the rest of their lives. However, these steps definitely saved some innocent lives. As the days went on, men reacted in different ways. Some resorted to praying aloud and promising to God they would lead, <coughs> they would lead better lives if rescued. Others focused on memories of childhood on the farm or home cooked pies or sweethearts that were waiting for them. After all, the war was just about over. Another way to cope was to try and encourage your buddy and keep him from giving up. This worked in some cases, not in others. I want to show this painting because I think this, while it's a completely different time period, reflects the agony and the despair this is a painting by a French painter, uh, either Delacroix or Jericho, on a merchant ship. And you just see the, you know, there's hope, but there's no hope. Over here, they've given up the anguish. These are the k Park life jackets, 2,500 of them. There are about a little over 1,100 men on the ship, so that was a blessing in disguise. These are the life rafts. They got a lot of life rafts off, but forward they were harder to get off because of the damage in the fires. They had minimal supplies. These are water kegs. Here's a close-up. So they had a slat bottom, ropes that people could hang to on the outside. Again, another. So, here's the question. How do they find them? How do they rescue them? On the island of Peleliu, they had regular American reconnaissance flights covering this area. They would fly over Japanese islands that were bypassed on the road to Tokyo. And the purpose was make sure they don't evacuate these islands, uh, make sure they're not resupplied. And also, if you see any downed American flyers, you can rescue them. Uh, they didn't have lookouts on these planes. Everything was radar and everything was, was uh, communication. So nobody's looking down at the bottom for anything. This fellow is the pilot 
of a Ventura plane. These are the kind of planes that would make these reconnaissance flights. August the 6th, a PV-6 piloted by Lieutenant Junior Grade Wilbur Gwynn, Glenn, Gwynn, he's flying at an altitude of 10,000 feet. He's having trouble with his antenna. The antenna they used, because of the huge distance, the plane would allow a cable to run out following the plane, and at the end of the cable was this antenna that would, in effect, give them extra capacity for over great distances. Problem was the antenna kept flip-flopping or coming loose from the cable. So Gwen is flying this plane and they're having trouble, so <clears throat> they have to repair it. And what they do is they're at 10,000 feet, they drop down to 5,000 feet for better visibility. They got the uh, Bombay doors and the, some of the doors open and they're grappling and trying to get the cable into the plane and it's flip-flopping. And one of the guys is looking down, and all of a sudden he sees something on the water that looks, it looks strange. He doesn't know what it is. He, he says, what? Well, let's go down and take a look. And they, he, they realize it's an oil slick. And they go, well, I wonder what that's from. And they think, well, maybe it was a Jap submarine that was sunk. So they drop down to 1,000 feet, and they see a head. It looks like somebody in the water. And then they see another one. They drop down to 200 feet. And they see five, and then 30. And then it looks like there's 50 men in the water. And they immediately send a message. Oh, the pilot wags his wings so, that, so they know he's been seen. They drop what few supplies they have, rescue supplies they have. And they drop it, <coughs> but the men know that he's been seen. He sends a message at 11.25 in the morning. He sends a second message later on saying there's 150 men in the water. Back on Peleliu, Lieutenant Adrian Marx fills his plane up with fuel, loads it full of rescue supplies. Now he has a PBY. This is Marx. I mean, these guys look so cool. It's like, you know, I would like to be that cool. You know? <clears throat> that was a. I'm not sure that, I'm, I don't know who that is. Anyway, here's, here's his plane, full of supplies. He is now headed to the rescue site. The first reaction, now these messages are now getting picked up by different commands too. The first reaction, we're skeptical. Nobody wants to believe the scope of this disaster. Quick, quickly, reality dictates a massive response Ships and planes are now being diverted to the scene with high priority. One of the first ships to uh, head there is a destroyer, the Cecil J. Doyle. Her commander is Lieutenant Commander Graham Clayter, who was a friend of this guy, the pilot. Clayter, the captain of the ship, doesn't even wait for orders. He says, let's go. Cranks, up, cranks her up to 22 knots, which was the top speed. An hour and a half later, he gets orders to head to the rescue. But that kind of quick, independent thinking is going to make a difference. It's going to help people. They estimate the oil slick to be 10 miles long, 5 miles wide. That They can see, from the initial plane, they can see there's at least 150 men in it. At 12.30, another destroyer, the, the Dufillo, is headed to join the rescue. She heads out at 22 knots, but she slows to 18 knots to preserve fuel because she knows she's going to be in the area a long time. Two hours later, another destroyer, the Bassett, and then the Ringness, and the Register, and then three, mid, three more destroyers. They're all headed to the sinking area. Late in the afternoon, there's seven ships en route, numerous planes, the PBY, piloted by Marx, he decides to land. Very, very risky decision. 12 foot swells, the wind is at eight knots. He says, we're going in. Brings his plane down. On the first bounce, she bounces 15 feet. On the second bounce, 
a little less. On the third bounce, she basically settles. A lot of the rivets are popped. There's water trickling in. But he's, he figures, we've got time. They are cruising among the men in the water very, very slowly. She picks men up. The first guys he picks up are men swimming alone or just with life jackets. He bypasses the men in the rafts and the floater nets. The guys in the rafts and the floater nets go nuts. They think they're not going to be rescued. They're swearing at them. They're, they're everything. But they know that there are planes and help is on the way. Another PBY will land, but he can only pick up one guy. The first PBY picks up 51 men from the water. They are tied to the wings with parachute cord. They are everywhere. They are filthy. Some of them are delirious. Many of the men, that, when they were rescued, didn't want to be rescued because they were so delusional they thought they were the Japanese. The Doyle, the first ship that's going to race to the scene, she's racing at top speed. Her chief engineer pleads with the captain, slow down, we're going to blow the engines. Captain's response, if they blow, they blow. We've got men in the water. As the Doyle arrives on the scene, she does another unconventional thing. A, ship, a combat ship at night in an area, a supposed sinking area, he says, turn the searchlight on, point it straight up. Because these men are in a huge area. Well, that's, that lets them know there's help out there. There was another situation of uh, throwing caution aside, and that was on the Bassett. One of the men, and the Bassett's at the scene, and one of the men sights a shark. And he says, look at that fish. Fish also was, to some Navy people, slang for torpedo. I never heard that, but it's in the book. The captain of the Bassett, who was not terribly nice nor well respected, says, out of here. Get all the boats in. We're getting the hell out of here. This is a combat area. And two of the junior officers on the bridge they grab him, and they said, no, sir, and they bring him to his quarters, and they stayed. The Bassett rescued more men than any other ship. As they're pulling the men in, some of the men are so weak they can't get in, and they need help getting on board. I'll just show you the. This is a picture of the PBY. Here's a raft. I mean, the seas are significant. This is, you've got a raft with one, two, three, four, five men in it, and one, two, three, four. You have two men over here, and this is a shark. They estimate one man was being killed every minute during the rescue by the sharks. Here's the Doyle, destroy the rescue. So their searchlight would be pointing straight up. Here's the, uh, the bat, uh, no, this is one of the others, it's uh, the ringness. And see, they had these landing craft on them, and so they were allowed, they could drop these boats in, and they were relatively low to the water, and so they had a flat stern, so they could actually reach over and pick the men up. Another one of the rescue ships. These weren't large ships. Here's the Bassett. Her captain, uh, if you, a couple of the books don't give him high grades. <clears throat> As the night of the second faded to the third, rescue continued, but late in the day, the amount of living became fewer and fewer. A total of 320 men were rescued. Three would die within a day. Ultimately, of the 12 ships, the Bassett saved the most, 151. A number of ships remained in the area searching for bodies. The USS French reported findings from her logs, such as body number 20, no identification, body badly mutilated. Body number 22, no identification, tags, ring, or watch, body decomposed. 
A total of 91 bodies were found and buried. To bury these bodies, they would wrap them in can uh, canvas, a two-inch line, and they would weight it down with three five-inch 38 caliber shells. The survivors are taken to a military hospital in Guam. Here, here they are. Total exhausted. This is after, this is uh, probably two weeks after. They're all together and they're being transported back to the United States. They were under strict orders not to divulge anything. They could say we're alive and we're in good health, but they could not mention anything about the loss. The Navy, <clears throat> the Navy would put an extreme clamp down on all items and news releases. A total of August 13th, telegrams were sent to the families of missing men. A total of 878 families received word of a loved one missing. The telegram went, I deeply regret to inform you that so-and-so is missing in action. The telegram goes on and closes with, to, to prevent possible aid to our enemies, do not divulge the name of his ship or station. This is the Enola Gay, the B-29. Here's a picture of her. This is after she dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. August the 6th, up to 140,000 people dead. Truman announces, quote, we are now prepared to obliterate, uh, obliterate every productive enterprise above the ground in any city. <coughs> August 8th, Russia declares war on Japan. Japan meets, still decides to do nothing. August 9th, this is the second atomic bomb. She's dropped in Nagasaki. 45 to 70,000 people are killed. August 10th through the 14th, surrender disc discussions with the emperor, but it wasn't until the 15th of August that the emperor decides to surrender. <clears throat> Little hometown newspaper here, my hometown, the Lewiston Daily Sun, August 15th, war is over. Over here, Indianapolis sunk. The Navy Department specifically withheld news of the sinking until they had good news. Uh, Admiral King, Admiral King is beside himself. He has Admiral Nimitz, he says, get a court of inquiry immediately. Court of Inquiry is going to convene at Guam, August the 13th. The president of the court is Admiral Lockwood, Vice Admiral Murray. Murray is one of the guys in charge of the whole operation. Now he's sitting on the court. The purpose of the Court of Inquiry, find out what happened, why, and who was, was responsible. They would interview 43 witnesses and several persons of interest. Now, a person of interest could be anybody not necessarily accused of anything, but possibly could be put on notice. As such, one was entitled to counsel, be present for all testimony, and cross-examine the witnesses. McVeigh would become a person of interest. The areas of question that the court dealt with, what were the weather conditions? Was the ship zigzagging prior to the attack? Among the people testifying at the Court of Inquiry was Captain Oliver Naquin, in charge of surf surface operations at Guam. Under his command, routing orders were issued to the Indianapolis, along with an assessment of minimal risk from Japanese submarines. In spite of knowledge of enemy subactivity near the intended route, as well as specific action reports, the Wild Hunter report, 
the top secret ALTA report. Naquin responded to the question of level of risk to ships traveling along Route PD as, quote, practically negligible. The court continued until August 20th. It's questions. <coughs> it says, how come nobody tracking the ship knew she was missing? It found fault with the lack of action taken by a number of officers who responded with answers such as, I, I knew she was overdue, but since she was reporting to another command, I didn't do anything. Or, we assumed she arrived, but we didn't check because of policy number 10 CL45. Policy number 10 CL45 says, you don't need to report arrival of combatant ships. Merchant ships, yes, but not combatant ships. Hence, you don't need to uh, report non-arrivals. That was the kind of thinking, and the, kind of some flawed logic there. The guy that came up with this policy was also the guy that told McVeigh nothing to worry about, the Japs are on their last, last leg. August 20th, at the conclusion of the court, the conclusion was numerous failures by shore commanders to take proper preventive actions. But the main reason for the delay in learning of the sinking was attributed to the failure or inability of the ship to send a distress message. It also found fail McVeigh's failure to zigzag was a contributory factor to the loss of the ship. It recommended to Admiral Nimitz that McVeigh be tried by a general court-martial for culpable inefficiency in the performance of his duty and negligently endangering the lives of others. The reaction of Ernest King upon hearing this recommendation was of furor and displeasure. He felt the court did not probe deep enough he felt there should have been far more witnesses. He questioned why the route was chosen, why no escorts available, who the hell made these decisions. But King was also convinced that there were problems with the manner that the Indianapolis operated. Discipline, organization, training, and leadership must have been at fault. King has also got a public relations problem. He's concerned with the Underhill and the Indianapolis sinkings, two ships lost within a with almost, well, a thousand men in the last weeks of the war. The public is screaming for an answer. How the heck can this happen? On the 25th of September, he writes to the Secretary of the Navy, James Forrestal, ordering him to launch an investigation into the routing instructions and to have Captain McVeigh tried by a general court-martial. Admiral King. Nimitz. This is James Forrestal, Secretary of the Navy. Before McVeigh's court-martial starts, a supplemental investigation took place to address some of King's demands for answers. It became apparent that there were numerous parties who received information concerning potential threats to her routing or, or were aware of her sinking. Lack of action taken by these commands extended very high up the Navy chains of command. If all of the people involved were interviewed, it would seriously delay McVeigh's court-martial. King said, go ahead with the court-martial. On the 29th, don't wait for the further investigations. On the 29th of November, Murray, uh, McVeigh is arrested. Charges are filed against him. The court-martial starts on December the 3rd. It gave the defense four days to prepare. The prosecutor, or judge advocate, was Captain Thomas J. Ryan. For the defense, Captain John Cady. On December the 4th, McVeigh pleads not guilty to the charges. As the trial goes on, witnesses testified to the weather that night, visibility, whether or not the ship was zigzagging, the abandoning of the ship, conditions in the water, and details related to discipline and leadership. In a totally unprecedented step, Captain Ryan <coughs> calls upon Captain, the captain of the I-58. Mochitsura Hashimoto to testify at McVeigh's trial. This is the captain of the submarine who sank the Indianapolis. 
never had the captain of an enemy ship been called to testify. There were over 400 ships lost in World War II. Nobody, that did not happen. Hashimoto sworn in. Now, he, Hashimoto was, was interrogated and testified uh, in Guam. They fly him over to, uh, to the court martial. And the thing that they're, 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 uh, Judge Advocate's working on is the failure to zigzag. That's a, that's a big hot button with him. And he's trying to get Hashimoto to say, yeah, if, if the ship was zigzagging, it would have been much, much hotter or I couldn't have hit her. And in earlier testimony, Hashimoto said, you know what, it really wouldn't make that much difference. It would make no difference at all. I was going to hit her. She was, it was guaranteed I could hit her. And he testified to that effect in Japanese <coughs> at an earlier trial uh, in Guam. But at this trial, he, his, his, testify, his statement is not interpreted as clearly and as precisely as he meant it to be. And he does kind of say, yeah, well, well, it's interpreted to say, yeah, I guess it would have been harder for me to hit him if he was zigzagging. So the judge advocate makes his point. He goes to another person. He goes to an American submarine captain. This guy's name is Captain Donahoe, highly decorated guy. And Donahoe initially said, yeah, zigzagging is not the problem here. It's not going to make any difference. And Katie, uh, Ryan keeps him on the stand, and you know, there was an adage that never interrupt somebody when, while they're making mistakes, a lawyer technique. And so he ultimately says, yes, because, oh, so the question is, well, yes or no, would it make a difference if he was uh, zigzagging? And at the end of his testimony, he goes, yes, uh, because, well, maybe just before firing, a zigzag would throw off your your uh, settings, but you could, you could correct it momentarily. Well, that sealed McVeigh's fate. So he is, uh, <clears throat> he is now, let me find the right page here. McVeigh's, he, he's doomed, he's court-martialed. He would retire from the Navy in 1949. Uh, he would suffer severe bouts of depression he would receive letters from family members who lost kin on the Indianapolis, particularly around Christmas time. And these letters were, were toxic. Uh, well, you're probably having a Merry Christmas. We would if you didn't kill our son. And they're very, very bitter letters. He uh, ultimately took his own life in November of 1968. Additional letters of reprimand took place to the four junior officers for failure to act accordingly, but they were withdrawn from their records. The reaction of the Indianapolis Survivors Association was overwhelmingly and consistently in support of McVeigh. This is an extremely active group that continues to the present. They would plead, plead his case to no avail. Numerous appeals to the Navy would not yield any results. There was a high school kid who took this topic for a history project. He tried to do what he could to get it overturned. Finally, October 12, 2000, House Resolution 48 clears McVeigh stating, in light of the remission by the Secretary of the Navy of the sentence of the court martial and the restoration of McVeigh to active duty, the American people should now recognize Captain McVeigh's lack of culpability. Of the 1,195 men on board, three out of four died. Out of 60, out of 81 officers, 67 died. Here he is at his court martial. Here is the Indianapolis today. Oh, the, that's the Enola guy. These are some of the members of the survivors operation. These guys, more to come. Don't leave early because we've got more to come on this front. <clears throat> Here she is. She's down in the 
Mariana's Trench, the deepest water in the world, 35,000 feet. Wow. USA Indianapolis, spare parts, number 35 on her hull, ship's bell, one of her turrets. The other two turrets, as she sank, fell out. Five-inch gun, any aircraft gun. Because of the cold and the darkness, there's been very, very little, uh, you know, de decomposure. This is part of one of the planes. Her anchor. And here's a full picture of her stern. The bow broke off here. Thank you.